Very excited to kick off uh, the first talk of the day with one of um, my favorite people, and I'm sure all of you as well. You are very familiar uh, with Mike Stish, or uh, Hackaday Mike, as I like to call him. Um, Mike is an uh, orchestra musician by night and a writer by day with, uh, who, oh, who started with Beam Robotics before falling in love with uh, microcontrollers and embedded systems. Um, please welcome him to the stage. He's the managing, edi managing editor of Hackaday. Thank you, Katie. All right, I, uh, I meant to prepare a talk for today, but unfortunately, um, Voya's badge hacking kind of got, got me, and so uh, I've been working on the crypto challenge. Is anybody else doing the crypto challenge here? One person, two person. So who's a what's is on number five already? I'm on number four. I know Garrett is over in the workshop doing number four right now, and I'm really stuck. So if you have any ideas, please help me out. And then the other thing is, Chris just said there hasn't been very much hardware hacking, but you got to check out Zach's badge. He pulled all the LEDs off of his badge and supersized the display on some air wire stuff. So seriously, all right. Uh, pretty awesome. So you do have six hours to do to one up him on that. Okay, so um, like Kitty said, my name is Mike Stish. I'm managing editor of HackyDay.com. Um, we love what we do. So we look at people that are using technology in new and creative ways and say, hey, isn't this awesome? Wouldn't it be awesome if we were like this? Can you help these people figure out why this is broken? Can you figure out why this doesn't work? And we just get together and say, interesting technology, yay. Um, we have a great uh, group of writers and editors. On any given month, we have about 20 to 25 people who are writing articles. Uh, we publish about 300 articles per month, uh, one at minimum every three hours around the clock, 365 days a year, um, which means I do not do very much looking back. I mostly do looking forward. You wake up in the morning, you go, is the calendar full? Ah, help me. And uh, you know, sometimes we have things like, We'll have a couple editors that are at a live event like this, and um, no one's allowed to publish without an, another person looking at it, and so it'll, there'll be these emails that go out. It's like, I just wrote this awesome post. Who's awake and can, can uh, schedule this one up? Uh, but the nice thing about Supercon is it, and, and this talk is it does make me go back and look over the last year of what we've done, and I'm, I'm blown away, even more so than any other year. Um, so I'm really thankful to have this opportunity to share some, some of it with you. Um, I could really do this all day pulling out random articles for you. Uh, oh, I am in presenter view. So anyway, uh, this is a great one. Structural engineer um, named Alex Weinberg, who um, worked on like uh, the Ground Zero um, building rebuild and, and did a lot of awesome stuff. But in his spare time, he looks at movies and says, you know, they blew up that bridge wrong. That bridge would not perform like that. So, and uh, of course, the art, most of the art you're gonna see in this talk is from our, our illustrator, Joe Kim. Um, but, you know, really, he goes over like uh, X-Men United when Magneto picks up the Golden Gate Bridge and, uh, you know, transports it to the island. And he's like, you know, this is a suspension bridge. It actually needs to be anchored or it would fall apart. So, you know, the, the really important stuff, the important engineering stuff. Um, we do a lot of uh, like engineering war stories. Brian Benchoff did a great job with this one of going back and looking at um, kind of the industry wars that were going on between AMD and Intel. Great story, loved it this year. Um, of course, Brian Benchoff also was the, the first one to break the news about Apple's ill-fated foray into single board computers. Uh, hopefully some of you realize the date on this one, um, but it got insane traffic. Like it got picked up by a bunch of different places. Um, and I think the real trick is that Brian actually built this board. So like this is not a rent, like he actually, and, and he was planning it like all year, like nine months ahead of time. Yeah, there's no headphone port. <laughs> I, Brian is a trend recognizer, he's a visionary, like he knows what he's doing. Uh, you know, the other thing is we like do deep dives into stuff that most people would find, you know, not interesting and like to the fanatical level. But I mean, the point is like everyone uses inductors and they're using a bunch of different stuff and nobody does all the different uses. And so Jenny's like, hey, I wanna go into all the stuff that people don't know about inductors but wish they did. And I'm like, yes, let's do that. And we actually had a bunch of different cool ones this year. Um, Dan Maloney came up with um, the field guide to the North American utility pole. 
So like you look up at the utility pole and you're like, what is that can that's up there? You know, what's that big muffler looking thing on the lines? And you know, there's technology all around us and just being able to, you know, kind of have an idea of what went into this, what makes our grid work, what is all this like invisible but still in plain sight stuff that makes life interesting. Um, we've had a lot of fun with that this year. Um, and I think what it gets down to is probably the saddest statement you could make is Hackaday is worth reading. Like it doesn't seem like something you have to say, but in this age of clickbait, um, you know, people are putting out, um, I actually don't have cable television, which is wonderful, but then when I go on a trip, I'm staying at this Airbnb that has cable television, I'm cruising through it, and I, there's a guide, you know, like you, there's a, anyway, I'm not used to that. Um, and there's a television program called 1,000 Ways to Die. And then I scroll down a little bit more, and there's a tele television program called Doomsday, Top 10 Ways the World is Gonna End, and I'm like, TV is as bad as the internet these days. So the point is there are so many places on the internet that they just want that, ooh, shiny, I'm gonna click that thing. And we shouldn't fall for that. It's kind of like the, the Gamjabar test from Dune. I can't do a talk without doing a Dune re reference. So the Gamjabar test is you put your hand in a box and your hand starts to get hot and it starts to tingle and it starts to burn and then you feel your, your flesh melting off. And if you can keep your hand in the box, they, it proves that you're human. And I think the point is, Hackaday is worth reading. It's worth saying, this is a headline that matters to me. It's something that is interesting or something that's gonna enrich me. It's something that's gonna inspire me. I'm gonna go there and actually read it instead of saying, ooh, top five ways that the world is gonna end. Uh, I think some of the things that we've done really well this year in, in that um, vein is like really looking at uh, electronics that are coming out. So we've kind of established ourselves as the voice of hardware. Um, I'm really proud of the work that we've done with it. Um, and really, the, the reason that we're good at this is that we are hardware users, so we love this stuff. Um, when we have an opportunity to get our hands on new equipment and it comes out, um, email the people that are writing, say, hey, who's good with embedded? Who, who's doing um, Raspberry Pi stuff? Um, what other boards are there out there, single board computers that we can look at? And we were very successful with that. I picked out just three, but there are dozens and dozens of these. Um, Brian Benchoff did a wonderful uh, Raspberry Pi um, benchmarking uh, where instead of just publishing the PR slate that gets put out by the company, he actually hooked it up and said, let's give it a try. And one of the, the favorite, my favorite things about a post like that is no matter how you do the benchmarking or what you do to test, there are gonna be 15 people telling you you did it wrong and how you would have done it. And so you think, well, hey, that's not very fun, but the conversations that spark out of those are really fascinating. So it's like one of the best places to go and be like, how do you actually do benchmarking and what are the benchmarks that actually matter and what are the test cases that matter? Go read those comments on that story. Um, obviously, every lo everybody loves the Raspberry Pi. I think the mission of the Raspberry Pi Foundation is wonderful. The hardware is incredibly um, useful and it's incredibly inexpensive. Um, but there are other options out there, and one of them that we tested out right away was that Odroid C2. I don't know if you guys heard about that at all, um, but there are other options, and so Hackaday is a place where you can see those other options and learn about them. Um, and then, of course, uh, the ESP32 has been coming out, and Elliot Williams has been really driving into that. Um, I think there are some special things going on there. So um, if you are a hardware manufacturer, you want to launch hardware, like monolithic, we are the only people that control our message advertising does not work for the people that are actually going to make that hardware popular. The, the, uh, the taste makers and the trendsetters that are the, the Hackaday community don't just want to read a shiny press release. And so one of the most interesting things that I think Espressive has done is, like we heard this rumor that the ESP32 was finally going to drop and someone emailed Sprite, because he's a friend of ours, and he's like, um, yeah, I can send you some, some test boards, which is great. Please send us test boards. We um, respect press embargoes. We're happy to keep your secrets until the actual launch comes out, but we want to do hands-on and look at that. Um, but then Espresso went way beyond that. Like Their software stack, their SDK, is totally not finished, and it's also totally been public for months already. And so um, as Elliot's working with his board, he's like, hey, what about the DMA controller? What about the power controller? And they'll come back very honestly and say, hey, we have, it's in the silicon. We just don't have the documentation for those registers yet. And then like every day you go back and check and it's like new documentation is there, new things are there to test out. Um, and so I think what I'm getting at is the, the new way, the modern way to get your hardware out there Get it in our hands early, and then let us talk to your engineers, because that's really what we want. That's really what the, like I said, tastemakers and trendsetters want. 
they want to see what's coming down the pipeline and they're forgiving. If you're honest about what's going on, if something doesn't work and you explain this isn't, doesn't work and this is why, they empathize. These are people that work with hardware every day. They're going through the same things you do. Um, and I think we're kind of leading the internet right now on telling the story and premiering hardware like that. There have been some problems this year, some challenges this year. Um, so uh, I'm guessing a lot of people here, people here have had a chance to use the Shaper Origin. Do you guys know what this is? Anybody here? So it's like a, a new machine tool. It's like a router that has like a CNC table built into it. It has a camera and um, it uses these uh, fiduciary tape to like know where you are on a workpiece and like cut out really intricate um, designs even though it's being driven by your hands. And I, and I think it's revolutionary. I've used it maybe two or three times over the last three years and it just gets better and better and better and they're finally getting to market with it. And a bunch of the other writers have used it and Garrett went to their headquarters and was like, this is amazing, I love this. And then he wrote that in his post. He said, this is amazing, I love this. And then immediately we get all these comments that are like, uh, is this a paid post? Don't you think you should disclose that you're being paid to do this? And it, we really run into the problem, like, are we allowed to like something? <laughs> so I do think, you know, the bottom one, uh, unbridled hyperbole is the problem. I guess I can take that, but really in this case, what are you gonna say about it? Like this is one of the first revisions and hasn't been widely used yet. That's about the worst thing that I can say about it. So I think finding that um, balance is something that we're gonna be working on. This isn't the only time that it happened. Um, we also, um, Joshua Vasquez, who is here, um, got to go and see the Wazer, like just as they were announcing it, which is like, a, you can put it in your workshop, um, water jet that was kickstarting and I think blew its uh, goal way out of the water. Um, and again, in that one, he just like said sunshine and lollipops about it, and we didn't say too many like critical or negative things. Um, but the truth is, Hackaday doesn't post paid content, uh, and so we get into a situation where we almost have to have like a negative disclosure every time we post something like, like this. We have to be like, no, it's not paid content. This is not an advertorial, and it's not really um, a commentary on Hackaday and what we're doing. It's a commentary on like the industry of the internet in that so many different outlets are doing advertorials and paid advertising and people don't trust what they're reading on the internet and that's really tough. Um, we want your trust and we want to earn your trust and gain your trust and so one of the things we're working on is how do we present our message so that you don't wonder if it's paid content. And again, you know, it's the internet, people are leaving com comments, I don't know what percentage of people are actually thinking that but it is a challenge. Um, so I think you know, what we're doing is crazy, right? We're actually just writing about stuff that we're interested in and try to break through and decide if you know, what we're reading and what we're getting on the PR side is spin or not and then like telling you about it. Like, go figure, imagine. Um, another thing that we had problems with that's a challenge is um, stories dealing with political topics can be a little bit difficult. So I do not like to kill articles, and I probably killed a total of four in the past year. Um, but one of the reasons that we do is someone wanted to publish, uh, had actually written an article on a project that was overtly about um, there's an election, like day after tomorrow. Uh, and it was like overtly one-sided for, you know, talking about one of those candidates. And um, it was great. It was actually like the idea was based on a thing that um, Matt Richardson did a few years ago where you hook up a microcontroller to a TV and you read off the subtitles and then look for keywords and then like mute or shut off the, the TV when you see those keywords. It was fun. But the problem we get into that with that is um, if it's overtly political, you can't actually have a conversation about the underlying technology because it's just like this firestorm of um, comments about the political side of it. I think that's a challenge for us because I believe in the free and open sharing of information and ideas. So we wanna, if we see interesting technology, we wanna provide a conversation platform for that. And if we get bogged down on political ideology that's not related to the technology, we lose the ability to have that conversation and that is a loss for everybody. Um, this slide is actually from a post that was written um, early on, just after the Orlando shootings this year, 
um, in media coverage of that, we started to see this kind of groundswell of people calling for smart gun technology. And um, one of our writers, Bob Badley, said, hey, I've thought about this a lot. I've looked into smart gun technology. There's a lot of challenges with it. We should talk about what smart gun technology would bring to the table and what the actual challenges are. Um, and he wrote it, and we got art for it, and we edited it, and we had it scheduled, and then there was another shooting. And it was not a good time to run that. It wouldn't be respectful. We wouldn't get the right conversation, so we held that. Some time passed, we scheduled again, there was another shooting. We actually held this for you know, six or eight weeks, and it's kind of a sad state of what went on um, in current events, um, and, but it's also you know, an interesting narrative on how can you have the conversation about technology and you know, divorce yourself from other topics of discussion. And we haven't solved that yet. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Anybody can write to editor at hackaday.com. So anything that I'm talking about, if you have ideas or concerns or questions, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Um, so those are a couple of things political that we're working on. Uh, going back to some good things we did this year, we started up a bunch of new columns um, with writers who have uh, deep backgrounds. So um, Jenny List has uh, a kit business. She does a lot of radio kits. And uh, she's like, hey, this is hard. A lot of people are trying to do this. Everyone's making the same problems, uh, facing the same problems. Why don't we actually like run some columns and talk about it? And she ran probably like a six-part column on what does it take to get from an idea to an actually actual kit? What are the chances that you're going to be successful at it? What do you actually measure your success as? Is it monetary? Is it just finding that you have customers? All this sort of thing. Going through to even like how to pick out a box to ship your product with. You know how to not get bogged down in customer support and by planning ahead of time. Um, Bob Badley has uh, been with a, a hardware engineer with a bunch of uh, startups, some of them successful and some of them not successful. And he did a really great job of documenting um, everything as he went along. So he's been doing these tool to trade um, series where he actually shows you like, here are all the options you have at different scales to do things like do rapid prototyping or actually do the assembly. Um, his test jigs is fantastic. Um, you got to go look at that one. I think uh, also we have a ton of contract. We have at least five writers right now who are working as contractors in engineering. And so um, we've just started sharing some of those stories. This one um, is an interesting one because it's published by an anonymous nom de plume, which I really don't like. We like to stand behind our articles. But I think in this case, this person's working in industry. They have customers past, present, and future, and they don't want to ruin that business, and I don't want to lose the story. So. Um, we'll do it as little as possible, but uh, I, I do think that this series is interesting and topical to everyone who reads Hackaday because I think most people would love to someday, you know, develop that trinket and start a business and, um, you know, this kind of uh, contracting is one of the ways that you can go out and do that because you, you don't have a full-time job, but you still have income that's coming in and you can kind of be flexible with starting your own company. So this is a path that a lot of people look at um, and we're trying to tell that story. Uh, let's see. Oh, I could make my speaker notes shorter. It's like a novel up here. Uh, <laughs> so I think um, one of the other challenges we're looking at is how to get our great content recognized. And this is um, really the cause of this problem is that our writers are not quite as, um, I'm sorry, our community is not quite as enthusiastic to share things as the uh, like cat aficionado community is. So if you think about it, like people are sharing cat content all the time. Um, it, cat content is cute and it's fleeting. You watch it for 12 seconds. Um, Hackaday content is, is cute, but it's not fleeting. You may spend you know, 10 minutes reading about it, 20 minutes reading about it. You may talk about it at, um, on a lunch break or at the uh, hacker convention or at your hacker space. Um, but for some reason, that you know, act of actually going out and sharing it, you know, sending links to people, putting it up on social media, getting it out there, doesn't happen quite as much. We really need to unlock that. Um, I think probably the best thing about Hackaday is like the technology that we're talking about has not been around forever. It's most of it is recent and new, and the people that actually invented it and you know, debugged it and made it work and made it popular and made it ac accessible to everyone are out there. And so when we talk about interesting things and interesting phenomenon, more often than not, somebody who actually worked on that shows up in the comments. It's amazing. I mean, for instance, Bill Hurd is here this weekend. So if you want to talk about 
Commodore computers and what it was like to um, you know, go through cycles. He did a talk on it yesterday, it was wonderful. That guy's actually here, people are here. Voya Antonis is here, um, he uh, is the inventor of the Galaxia computer, which was the most popular um, personal computer kit in uh, Yugoslavia when he invented it at eight, I think 8,000 units made. Like these people are around and so if they're not around in Hackaday yet, we wanna get our articles out there so that they know like this is the place to hang out. So um, the biggest part of getting people to share and getting our, our articles out there is just gathering the flock, getting all the people um, that should be on Hackaday discussing and, and sharing and kind of moving things forward. Um, I would like to mention we do have an amazing mechanism for the community to tell us what they think is cool. Um, this is a picture from our uh, tips page. So you can go to the submit uh, link up on the top of the page and, and send us what you think is cool. You could also just email tips at hackaday.com. Um, but our tips page was the uh, 68th most trafficked link of the year. That's pretty incredible. Uh, so thank you very much. We live and die on the tip, tips line, so thank you. So I think uh, you know the, the way to close it up is looking into the future. So first of all, we don't you know plan things year out as far as content goes. We are looking for what the trends are right now. And so again, like you tell us what you think is cool. Please email us, send in tips, that sort of thing. But I can give you some ideas of where I think uh, the next year is going to take us. Um, so Elliot wrote this post middle of last year and kind of the end of last year, um, and I've I've been. Uh, ranting about this forever. F fingerprint uh, technology on your phone is just such a horrible way to secure things. And so I think we're gonna see big problems with malware stealing uh, fingerprint reader technology and doing something nefarious with it at some point. Um, Elliot's already written about that. Obviously, your internet-connected toaster was a bad idea. We've been telling you that for years. You know it. I mean, it's not like we've been telling you. We've just been you know, shouting from the hilltops and you've been joining us. Um, and of course, it's kind of... Uh, come home to haunt us, hasn't it? So we've seen these denial of service attacks um, that are coming from you know, webcams and, and DVRs and that sort of thing. Um, and the coverage of what the problem actually is has been really not good. Like explaining to people how their everyday lives are somehow being disrupted by these things that they installed in their home not knowing that they were gonna be a problem, like the explanation of it is bad. So we're trying to do a really good job of clearing that up I mean, I don't want to trash on the BBC because I like the BBC, but they were using like 198, um, 192.168 um, IP addresses to explain the denial of service stuff. And we're like, well, you know, fundamentally that's probably not right either. So looking at, um, you know, how, how hardware and hardware um, security flaws are affecting our lives and explaining it so that more people can understand, I think is going to be really big. Um, probably the scariest thing for me is this problem is not fixable. We ran an article a week or two ago um, about one of the webcam companies um, recalling those webcams. Most of those webcams were installed by subcontractors in places like banks. The bank doesn't know what model of security cam they have up there. The subcontractor's long gone. They already got paid. No one's gonna return those cameras. I, you know, it's never gonna happen, but for me, um, when I think about it, really the only way we're gonna fix a problem like that is like white hat malware that goes out and plugs the security holes for us. And that's not ethical, you know, like you can't just go and change people's passwords even if it's for the better. So like this problem is gonna be around for a long time and it's still getting worse. Like we haven't, um, you know, we need to get the message out to every product engineer, every hardware engineer out there that like you can't ship a product that's gonna end up creating an army of evil robots that are all coming to get us. So I think we're gonna see a lot of that, uh, about that next year. Um, and I think we're just gonna continue, you know, putting the message out that when you see something interesting um, in tech that's news, Hackaday is the place to go and talk about it and go and learn about it. Um, it's the place where people would rather build it than buy it. They'd rather fix it than trash it. And they'd like to take it apart and see how it works. And um, that is Hackaday. You make us Hackaday. It's gonna be another great year. Thank you so much.